Good evening, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to our interview this evening with Dr. James or Jim Schaefer from Vero Neurology, and we will be discussing the injectable medications for multiple sclerosis. Good to see you, Stuart. How are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. It's nice to see you again as well. So first, I would like to know if you can please name the injectable medications that are for multiple sclerosis. Sure, well, I mean, the injectables are, are hard and true medicines, it's been out for several years. These were the first generation medications that came out for treatment of uh, relapsing forms of MS. Our first medication was, was, was beta -seron. Uh We came then with the Avonex, we came into Rebif, and we came in with Copaxil. Those are our four major our injectable medications that were our first line therapies for several years. Great. So. What can you tell us about the difference of the different medications? How are they injected? How are they used? What is the frequency? Sure. Well, again, again these medicines have been around for several years now, so we have a lot of very good data looking at the safety and the efficacy of these medications. And so the bottom line with all these in injectable meds, with any therapy with MS, Stuart, as you know, is we, are, we, want to, we want to minimize the risk of progression of disability. We want to reduce the number of relapses. We want to uh, minimize lesions in MRI. In those certain groups of patients, we want to minimize the, new, the definitive diagnosis of MS, and we want to reduce brain atrophy in patients. So what are the differences in these medications, and what, how do they work? Well, you've got two classes, basically. We have the interferons, which are basically which are Rebif and Avonex and um, uh, beta seron. And then we have glutaromyositate, which is Copaxone. Okay, they're all injectable. Uh, Copaxone, Rebif, and beta seron are injected sub-Q. Uh, Copaxone now is three times per week sub-Q. Rebif is uh, every other day, as uh, is beta seron, and Avonex is weekly. Okay, Plegarity is also there now too. Is there a newer, is the newer, I don't want to say the newer form of Avonex, but it's, they don't like to call it the new Avonex, but it's Plegarity. We'll talk about that difference in a little bit. But it's also injected, but not IM like Avonex is, but also sub-Q. Great, thank you for that reply. What kinds of side effects do you have from these medications? And even before I get into that though, what is the frequency of how each of those medications are used, the ones that you mentioned just previously? Sure, well we have, we have uh, Avonex, which is intramuscular on a weekly basis. We have Plegarity now, which allows for twice monthly injection. We have um, Copaxone, which is now gone from daily to three times per week, thrice weekly, Rebif thrice weekly, and beta seron every other day, or QOD or every other day. Great. So now back to what I was going to say, and that is what kinds of side effects can people expect that might happen while using any of these injectables? And let's start with the interferons, and then you'll go to the to the Copaxone. Sure. So the interferons as a class, um, we have seen over the years that these patients may experience flu-like symptoms. Um, and they're basically the typical flu-like symptoms of myologists, you know, arthrologists, sometimes they may have some, some diaphoresis or, or, or sweating, but generally are some, are some chills. Um, but generally it's mild. Generally, they're not, they don't last more than four to six weeks. And in some cases, by titrating the therapy, sometimes early on, it minimizes or mitigates some of those side effects of flu-like symptoms. Um, injection site reactions are always part of any time you're injecting the skin. Um, Sub-Q, as opposed to IM, have different um, potential side effects. Some of the sub-Q injections create a redness or an induration in the injection site. IM can be a little bit more uncomfortable because you're going into the muscle. Um, but generally, those are the big ones, the flu-like symptoms. Uh, rarely, some, some patients who are prone to depression uh, have to be careful with the interferons and rarely, I think maybe a half a dozen cases in 20 years I've seen where people have gotten more depressed on the interferons. Great. Copaxone, uh, to follow up on the question, uh, Copaxone, it, it, don't see the like symptoms as much, but we do have sometimes a more of an issue at times with the injection sites over time. Um, you get into something called lipoatrophy in some of the areas because you are injecting. Uh, that's been mitigated a bit by reducing the frequency of that dosing down to three times a week as opposed to seven times a week and rotating your sites mitigates that. But um, injection site reactions are probably the primary thing we have seen with, with, uh, with, with Copaxone, but not as much with the flu like symptoms. Is there anything that people can use in advance of taking their injectable therapy that will reduce 
any side effects? Yeah, sure. There's there's all kinds of great great uh, great ideas out there, and patients come up with the best ones. But the common ones are an anti-inflammatory, uh, like an Advil or an ibuprofen, a Tylenol can be used a half hour to an hour or two before you take your therapy, and you can take it after therapy as well. Sometimes uh, uh, rubbing the site with a with a, with a, with, a, with some a cool ice or something can, uh, after the injection can be helpful as well too. But mostly an anti-inflammatory prior to and after um, or the next morning you get up is, is a good thing to do. Great, thank you for that answer. Plegridae, the newest form of injectable therapy, what makes it so different from any of the others? Yeah, well, um, right, so what is it, what's, what's, how does it make a difference? It's, not, it's the new high-dose <laughs> interferon, right? Um, you know, the uh, Plegridae is, by name, is, it's what's called PEG interferon. So what they did was they took Avonex, and, and basically the same molecule, um, beta-1A, and they pegylated it. They put something called polyethylene glycol, so they call it PEG, and they attached it or, or formulated it so that the molecule is wrapped within this peg, pegylation. Um, it's called pegylation. By doing this, by giving it sub-Q, it prolongs the, 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 the biological effect of the medication over a longer period of time. So basically you're, you're just extending, it's like a time-released Avonex over, the, over a two-week period for if you get your next injection. Thank you. How effective are these medications in reducing relapse? Okay. As a class, they're all very similar in, in, their, in reducing relapses. You know, they've all had their individual phase three trials where uh, they came to approval through the FDA. Um, there have been some comparative trials over the years, uh, incoming, beyond, evidence. Um, there have been a few, three, of, there's three or four trials have done to compare the two, but, or compare the class. But as a whole, um, and their individual trials, they reduce relapses by about 30 to 35 percent, um, upwards of course 40 percent. They reduce the progression of disability um, over two years by 37 to 40 percent or so. MRI lesions are uh, reduced anywhere from 65 to 75, 78 percent as a class. So as a class, they're very similar. Um, we can't compare the drugs to each other very well because those trials were done in very different subsets of patients. So it becomes difficult, and that's where talking to patients and deciding on a therapy with patients is always tricky because patients always say, well, you know, they try to compare the drugs and you really, it's hard to compare them because they're very different population subsets when you're studying these drugs. So, I'm an MS patient, I'm newly diagnosed and I come to see Dr. Schaefer and I need to know what you're gonna do for me and you want me to go on to an injectable therapy and I wanna know how you're gonna choose what's best for me to take. That's a great, great, great question. I get that question every day. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get all the literature and I'm gonna hand you all the literature and tell you to go home and pick out what you want and come back and tell me. I'm just kidding, totally wrong, <laughs> okay? That's what I see all the time, which is, which is I think, classically uh, um, um, not, not the best uh, for the patient, because here's why. The materials they get in the, from, the, from the drug companies are, are good, they're informative, but they're, they are meant to market to the patient and, you know, and, and look at the pretty pictures and things and not really understand really what the therapy is doing for them, okay? So as you're a patient, you see me. So are you a man or a woman? Do you have a job that has you traveling um, five days a week? Do you have kids? Don't have kids. Do you, um, are you active? Um, you know, what are your comorbidities as far as medical problems? There's a whole milieu of things we look at. Lifestyle, your, your own, your own um, you know, um, preferences, um, your comorbidities as far as medical problems go, um, several things. And so we take that and say, here's a class of medications. One of them is twice a month. One of them is once a week. One of them is every other day. It's on sub-Q. One's I am. Um, you know, we work with the patient together and decide that. There's no one good answer for that question, honestly. It depends on the person and all those things we take in consideration. So would you choose an injectable medication over any of the other therapies that are currently available? Well, again, therein lies a real complexity now, right back in the day, and you know very well as I do, we've been on this for a long time. You know, I, I was, when I first was being trained in, in the world of MS, you know, we were told that not, don't use, quote, these medications, as, medications until, as they say, the patient's really going bad. I mean, when they're really getting in trouble. And that was the mindset at that time, and that's when Avonex and beta serum were just coming out. We know now, complete opposite. Treat early, treat aggressively, and get up front of this stuff. So. In, in saying that, you know, these patients that you're going to put on medication, you want to treat them as early as you can, okay? Um, you want to use a medication that has got proven efficacy 
proven safety profile and it works. These medicines work. They've been around for a long time. In the last six, seven years, we've, we've almost doubled the amount of dr drugs we have available at MS. So it's become very complex. We have oral medicines. We have IV medicines every six months, IV medications once a month. We have many therapies. So here you are, you're in my office. You know, why do I want to go on an injectable medication? Again, it depends on the patient. Some patients say, listen, doc, I, want the, I don't want a needle. I can't stand a needle. I want to do a needle. Fine. They say, doc, I've got, you know, uh, lifestyle with me that I, I, I don't want to think about this stuff. I want an infusion once a month. That's it. Some people say, I want hard and true medicine. Been around 20 years. I know I'm not going to get this PML stuff. I'm not going to get any, I don't have any worries about this kind of thing. I want to go with the old and true medication. That may be a therapy potential. The other side of it is this. We look at the patient clinically. What's their MRI look like? We know the new drugs, honestly, are very effective in reducing MRI lesions. Very effective. More so than our, than our old medicines. What's their age? How aggressive is their MS? How many relapses are they having? All those things play a role. We now have a, we have a stronger armamentarium now, so we have a reason to go there. But for the most part, these drugs are very effective. They're very good and very safe and very efficacious, and it's a very good and a very still a very strong line of first line therapy. So, what then would be the reason for changing from an injectable therapy to one of the other um, MS? FDA-approved therapies that are out there, treatment therapies. Sure, it's a good question. As I mentioned before, we've got a, we've got this really luxury now of having so many therapies out there to help us. And for us that do MS a lot, it's a nice thing to have. And for those who have a little, not quite as much experience in MS, they it tends to be a bit of a, of a confusion for them. But here's here's how we look at it now. We we really, since we have so many therapies out there available, uh, we become less tolerant to any. Um, things that relate to progression of the MS, i.e. Um, relapses, i.e. progression of disability, change in examination, and MRI lesions, okay? So we, now we, we begin to use this more, this criteria, you've heard this thing called NIDA, no evidence of disease activity. And so we really are becoming stringent on that because we can attain that today. Whereas 10 years ago, we couldn't really do that because we had limited we had three or four drugs, moving laterally to other, other, other injectables, and you know, maybe or may not make a, make a difference, you hope. So now we have someone on an injectable, let's say a first line therapy, they're doing very well. As a matter of fact, this week I have a young lady, a school teacher, who's been treated for me for close to 10 years now, over 10 years. Um, she even got off meds for a while, had a family, she's got back on meds, she's doing very well. But the last two MRIs, we've seen more and more enhancing lesions, small, but still there. She's very functional, she has a normal exam, um, no relapses per se, but I've got an MRI that's lighting up. So this week alone, she's been on an injectable all these years. We, we, we moved her off space and put her onto an oral. So we look at these things. So the oral medications I mentioned earlier are a little, a little more robust in their data on MRI lesion reduction, um, relapse reduction, and, and disability progressions about the same. But those factors are important. So we're moving her off, off base. And so for that reason, let's see if we can shut down the MRI activity because it's very important. We know it has uh, implications later for her. She's only in her 40s now, so we want to keep her going for the next 20 years, 30 That's years. That's true. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for her, too. So when you are doing a switch, though, from one medication to another, do you do a washout period on any of these medications? Well, generally, uh, again, today in speaking about the injectables, really don't do any major washout. I mean, you know, but by nowadays, as you know, with the insurance companies and stuff, by the time you start switch, doing the switcheroo, you better start early because it's going to take you four to six weeks anyway <laughs> to get a drug changed, to get approved and prior authorizations and things of that nature. So um, the interferons and copaxone, uh, plegarity, there's really no washout. Um, you know, um, the orals, we may do a month, um, you know, um, to Sabri, upwards of a month. Um, but, and um, you know, some of the old newer, more, more, um, uh, the, the more complicated medications, maybe longer, and we have to look and see, how, you know, are, are we increasing the, the risk of um, opportunistic infections by certain, by moving to certain classes of medications. But generally, as it's big answer to the question, we don't do much washout with the, with the interinjectable medications. Would you ever recommend to a patient to switch from an injectable therapy to an oral or an infusion medication? 
Yes, we do. And <clears throat> we have uh, patients who are on their injectables. And you know, over the years, uh, since we've been at this nearly 20 years here, over the years, most many of my base patients were on the injectables because that's all we had at the time. And over the last six to you know five to seven years, we've we've more, more moved into these more newer therapies. Um, and certainly, the patients as they as they change over time. Um, if we're seeing a change in their, in their neurological examination, their EDSS scores, uh, if we're seeing an increase in relapses, we're seeing MRI changes that are, that are not favorable, either lesions, <clears throat> increasing atrophy, um, and general the patients too, and how they're doing, are they holding up their therapy, are they continuing to inject? Um, we came to find that many patients um, really haven't been injecting as frequently as they should be because of side effects they hadn't reported over the years. And now when the new medicines came out, they're like, you know, I really haven't been injecting on a regular basis and I really don't like this. I have less side effects. And we're like, gosh, you know, whatever it takes to get you on therapy, we'll get you on to an oral therapy. But certainly we are, we are switching patients, but it's not a matter of just doing it because it's a new drug. You know, if they're on, the, today if they're on Avonex or, you know, beta serum or Copaxone and they're rock solid, we don't mess with it because we can't say, we can't tell them they're going to do as well if it's such a nerve therapy. So it has to be for a, real, a clinical reason. So you brought up uh, a point that I was going to bring up next, and that is <clears throat> for compliance reasons, which do you feel is, is patients being more compliant with injectables or the orals? Uh, well, I, I think that... Um, I, I don't think I could really say that there's a major difference, honestly, because the patients who are really committed to their therapy with the injectables, they are very committed to their therapy. Um, I think it's an early on commitment or non-commitment that we find out later they may necessarily be committed from the get-go. But those who are committed, even when we want to try to get them off those therapies, they don't. They fight you sometimes. They, they like their injection. They almost feel like they're doing something by injecting. You know, it's like, okay, I'm, you know, it's 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 this whole mindset. Um, <clears throat> The orals in some way, you know, a, a, a BID oral can be complicated because the second, that second dose in a day, sometimes patients don't, they forget that dose. Taking a pill one, I mean, if, I, honestly myself, I get, I get antibiotics, I have a hard time taking my pill once a day. So, but taking a medication sometimes is so benign in that rate oral that you kind of, it slips by you. That injection is something that's really hard to forget about because you know you have to do it. So I, I think it's pretty even. I haven't seen a major, at least in my practice, I've not seen a major um, compliance issue either way, though I think it may be easier to be compliant to an oral because you're not necessarily you know, injecting for those people who don't like to inject. Okay, so now not wanting to put you on the spot or anything, um, but just in general, do you feel that neurologists these days are, are um, Will, will lean toward giving the injectable over an oral, or are they leaning toward giving the oral over the injectable? I think that um, we have to break that up into the neurologists who are, I, I would say, that are general neurologists that treat a lot of neurology and a little bit of MS, and those who treat a lot of MS patients. Um, I think that the, the, the non-MSologist, if you will, tends to go with the flow on, the, on what's the current new, newest, newest and greatest kind of thing. And I think that's where a lot of people try to uh, market, um, you know, those, those particular sets of, of uh, uh, neurologists to provide therapies. Um, I think that uh, the MSologist, me myself, we look at the patient and we really make the decision based on the patient and their whole global presentation clinically and personally decided it should be an injector or it should be an oral. I really don't go into a room saying, you know, first line here, you're going to go on oral therapy. It's not always that, not always that simple. Great. Well, Dr. Schaefer, I, Stuart Schlossman, and MS Views and News would like to thank you for being here today. No, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's always good to see you. Nice seeing you, too. Thanks, Stu.